All right, good afternoon, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Jose Santa Maria, the uh, museum director here at TELS. Uh, welcome uh, 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 to our uh, February Science Friday night. A lot of stuff going on, as you know, the museum is open until 9 o'clock, so after the lecture, you have museum left, the observatory open tonight until 10 o'clock, and we have some very, very nice skies. And as a special treat, our, our, uh, our speaker tonight, Ed Albin, will, will stick around and be up in the observatory after the lecture. Uh, so an extra treat. Uh, planetarium shows are ongoing. If you have 8 o'clock uh, uh, tickets, we're not going to warn you, so if you keep, a, keep a track on time, and we're not going to be offended if you walk out a little bit before 8 o'clock. Doors close at 8 o'clock. You will not be able to get in if you're late. A uh, couple of things, uh, housekeeping things, please. Let's get, uh, let's get these guys on vibrate or just turn off the sound, please. And um, please, please resist uh, uh, be, being on screen time while, while the speaker is speaking because uh, uh, we're seeing what you're doing behind you. So it's very distracting to the people behind you if you have these things on bright. Or at least turn the lights down or go up to the nosebleed section. Uh, uh, any members here tonight? All right, good deal, thank you so much. Hey, um, I just proved the, the upcoming newsletter. Wow, is there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, I, I can't even go into ha half of it. So you're gonna be getting your uh, electronic newsletter uh, early next week. And there's just a lot of stuff going on in uh, uh, March, April, and May. A uh, Couple of quick things I will mention though. Uh, Friday evening the 11th, we're having an adult only mixology night. You'll get to learn about bitters and you get to mix, invent your own cocktail. How's that? That's 21 and over only. Uh, for a hardcore uh, mineral nuts, we have our annual mineral symposium March the 19th, and then we have another exhibit opening uh, later on in March, uh, the evening of the 25th. We're opening superhero materials, opening up our exhibit on material science, a lot of hands-on stuff that you get, you get to manipulate all kinds of uh, crazy looking, uh, uh, crazy, uh, uh, crazy material. Uh, we are broadcasting this lecture out into the Great Hall, so if you have uh, fidgety li little ones and, and you, need, you need to leave, you're not going to miss anything. The lecture will be out, uh, out in the Great Hall. Uh, I think I covered uh, just about everything, so I'd like to now bring over our Director of Education and uh, former astronomer David Dundee, who is going to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. Well, good, good evening, everyone. It's so great to see everybody here for another Sci-Fi night. We have a range for beautiful, clear weather out in the observatory, so please don't uh, miss uh, taking a look through our telescope. It'll be a gorgeous night, and the telescope's open until uh, 10 out there. And it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Uh, Ed and I uh, went out to, to dinner earlier, and he, he was telling his, uh, his wife after he retired from Fernbank uh, after he and I shared an office for 20 years that, uh, uh, that the two of us were, were engaged now. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> we, Ed and I have had many, many adventures together uh, in astronomy, uh, and uh, it, it, we were uh, always the magnet downstairs uh, for, uh, uh, how shall I put this, people with interesting ideas about the cosmos. And uh, what's that? Eccentric, yes, it's a good astronomy word. And so uh, he and I had, had, had lots of adventures together uh, with that. Uh, Ed and I managed not to, to beat on each other too much because uh, he got his undergraduate degree from uh, Arizona State and mine was from University of Arizona. And so uh, there was always conflict during football season. Unfortunately, University of Arizona always lost, so anyway. But uh, uh, we, we, we had a lot of enjoyable times. And uh, uh, since then, uh, I, of course, left Fernbank uh, back in 2008 and came up here to, to establish the astronomy program here. And Ed uh, stayed another 10 years at Fernbank and then moved on to do all sorts of interesting things you're going to hear about. Uh, but right now, he is the uh, interim director of the Observatory and Planetarium at Agnes Scott College, which has an excellent uh, astronomy program. And I'll tell you a little interesting factoid about Agnes Scott. The observatory there has a 30-inch telescope, and the dome of the observatory actually came from Cartersville. And there was a doctor who lived way at the end of West Main Street, uh, the big house there, if you keep going straight and go up his lawn, uh, there used to be an observatory on top of that house, 
and uh, the telescope ended up in Texas, but the dome ended up uh, down at, uh, in, at Agnes Scott. I'm not really sure how that happened, but uh, that's, <laughs> that's where it is, a little bit of an Ag Agnes Scott Cartersville connection. Well, since, uh, since the time of uh, Ed's retirement, he decided he, he kind of liked to, to continue in astronomy. He got himself a small telescope and then a bigger telescope, and he started playing with cameras, and he bought himself a, a small uh, cabin out at Deer Lick Observatory, which is one of the, the dark sky, international dark sky sites in Georgia out towards Augusta, and he has been taking incredible pictures of the deep sky uh, objects, and you're going to see them here tonight. So it's with a great pleasure I introduce my old friend, Ed Alvin. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction, Dave. Uh, it's really good to, to be here, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share some of my astrophotography with you. Um, I, I really got into, as Dave said, imaging the sky, taking pictures. Uh, once I moved out to Tolliver County, uh, where I set up uh, an observatory in the Deer Lick Astronomy Village, uh, it is the um, darkest and most beautiful uh, night sky, really um, east of the Mississippi River. Um, the, the county, unfortunately for the county, uh, the county is experiencing negative growth, which is ac actually a, a good thing for astronomy because there aren't uh, any street lights to uh, disrupt the night sky. So let me see if, um, I wanted to, to say a little bit about how I got into this um, crazy um, idea of staying up late looking at the sky and taking pictures. Uh, it really started out um, when, when I was in high school. Um, I, uh, over here, um, you can see me in high school with a couple of telescopes. I, I started out visually looking at the sky, finding uh, the constellations, bright stars, and decided that I wanted to build a telescope. I came across a book in high school on how to make your own telescope. And, and that, that was actually the most frustrating and the most uh, uh, probably enjoyment in terms of uh, a project that I had ever done. And you can see uh, this telescope here. It's an eight inch uh, reflecting telescope. I had ground and polished the mirror and it really wasn't all that great, but that telescope allowed me to see galaxies, star clusters, uh, the rings of Saturn, um, double stars, uh, things that we are, are going to see pictures of, of tonight. And so I, I was really hooked on, on astronomy and went to, uh, started out at Valdosta State College. As an undergraduate, and you can see me up there with the 12-inch uh, telescope sitting on top of Nevins Hall down in Valdosta, and then uh, worked uh, on my master's degree at Arizona State. Here I'm at Lowell Observatory looking through the 24-inch telescope that was used by Percival Lowell, astronomer there, um, to observe Mars. And much of my career was spent uh, at Fernbank Science Center uh, working with the planetarium and that beast that you see there that Dave and I uh, love so very much and is still at, at the Science Center, although they've gone with the more recent technology, but the star machine still, still does work. And uh, here's a recent image out at, um, this was last November, I was in Arizona in the Catalina Mountains um, doing some astrophotography out there. But the astrophotography that I'm going to show you, uh, the, the images that we're going to see tonight were taken from Tolliver County 
about 120 miles east of Atlanta. This is my observatory. It sits on a two-acre lot. Um, there are 96 acres at the Deer Lick Astronomy Village in about two dozen astronomers, amateur astronomers, who have uh, land out there and have set up observatories. Now, th this is a very different kind of observatory from the one that you're going to see tonight here at TELUS, where you have the dome and the telescope inside of a dome. This is a roll-off roof observatory. The whole roof will roll off, so you can put a number of telescopes up. And when I, when I first moved out there, I, I retired from Fernbank in 90, or actually two, uh, 2016, and bought the property um, out in Tolliver County in uh, 2018. I, I was really sort of disappointed that it wasn't a domed observatory, because that is what I was used to uh, at Fernbank Science Center and elsewhere. But I've really come to enjoy having this roll-off roof observatory. When the roof comes off open, uh, you're under the stars, so you can see the Milky Way. And while you're imaging, uh, shooting stars, and, and that, that sort of thing. So this is uh, in the middle of a dark sky site. Uh, there are ordinances against uh, street lights. And if you have a street light in the city of Sharon, a small city there, it has to be shielded or the lights have to project down toward the ground. I operate uh, two main telescopes. Uh, the images that you're going to see this evening were acquired with these telescopes. Over here is an 8-inch, what we call a RASA 8. Uh, the, the mirror is 8 inches across. Uh, this is a finder scope that I use for guiding, a guide scope. And the main camera for this one is inside of the barrel of the telescope at the front of the, the telescope. It has a very, very wide field. It, it's working at what we call F2. So I can look at a, a large section of the sky. This is my other telescope. This is a 14-inch Celestron Schmidt Cassegrain. The uh, mirror is 14 inches across. And this is actually one of my favorite telescopes because it is so versatile. This, this telescope, this type of telescope goes back to the 60s and 70s. And uh, in fact, talking with Dave uh, back in the office area, I saw, saw Celestron Schmidt Cassegrain back there. And these, these are really great telescopes for astrophotography. And I have a camera, camera hooked up here for um, planetary imaging. And I wanted to say a little bit about cameras. For astrophotography, you can actually get started with your cell phone. Uh, if you have a small telescope, there are um, mounts that you can buy to mount your cell phone on there. So you can take pictures of the moon and uh, the planets with your phone. That's a good way to get started. That's sort of how I started getting into digital astrophotography. But ultimately, you're, you're going to want to graduate to these digital cameras, uh, like you see here. This is a uh, Zuo ASI 294. It just sim simply means it's a, um, a camera built for astrophotography. It's not a CCD camera. Uh, in the astronomical uh, community, the technology is advancing to what we call CMOS chips, going from the charge coupled device to a, a CMOS chip, which is less expensive to produce and much more sensitive. So I have a couple of cameras, this one for deep sky imaging and uh, another camera that I use for um, imaging planets. OK, so let's take a look at. Uh, some celestial objects that um, are great targets. If, if you're just getting into astrophotography, you really can't go wrong by shooting the moon. And this was taken with my RASA 8 telescope uh, with a full moon uh, back in January of, of last year. And 
A lot of the work that you see in modern astrophotography happens after the image is acquired. What you will do is, uh, for example, um, take a series of images um, close to, I think this one was about 2,500 images uh, that were taken over a, a two-minute period, and then you stack half of those and do uh, some image processing. And in this one, I uh, enhanced the saturation so you could bring out uh, some of the color of the moon, um, some of the dark maria. Um, you can see compositional differences, titanium and iron-rich areas. These are huge areas of the moon covered by lava flows. And when you look at the moon, you'll notice through the telescope that the northern part of the moon is pretty smooth and composed of much younger terrain. In the southern hemisphere of the moon, the cratered uplands have lots and lots of craters. This is the crater Tycho showing its, its beautiful rays. But the moon is, is a good place to start. Um, I love photographing uh, the crescent moon. Here you see the moon. This was um, almost two weeks after that full moon in February, uh, February 8, 2021. Very, very early in the morning, the waning crescent moon. I, I just happened to be up and see the moon rising above the pine trees uh, from my observatory. So I uh, slewed the telescope over there and snapped, snapped a picture uh, showing the moon. Now, now the moon was in, in the news recently, uh, toward the end of, of last year, back in November, and many of you folks may have uh, uh, visited TELUS to come look at the moon during the total, well, actually, it was a partial, it was what we call the almost total eclipse of the moon on the 19th. Um, all but uh, that small section at the bottom of the moon moved through the shadow cast by the Earth. And it, it was actually quite beautiful. This image was taken about 4 a.m. in the morning. I had, had lots of coffee. And I was astonished at how ruddy red the moon looked, some of the um, light. Uh, of course, the shadow of the Earth is being cast onto the moon, and some of the sunlight sneaks around the Earth's atmosphere, uh, sort of like a sunset, and that's projected onto the moon, giving it a, a very, very gorgeous ruddy red color. And that's, uh, if you're getting into astrophotography, if there's a lunar eclipse, uh, that, that's a good place to start as well. You, I've seen lots of images of the November eclipse last year that were taken with uh, an iPhone attached to a small telescope. Um, but a, a very, very fun target. Another target that I recently started to image is a star called, our star called the sun. We often forget, you know, that big ball of light up there in the sky that's uh, giving us warmth in, in a beautiful afternoon today is a star no different from all of those stars we see in the nighttime sky. Uh, however, you need to be, always be aware when you observe the sun, you have to be very, very careful. Uh, you, you don't want to go out and stare at the sun, and especially so with a, um, a uh, telescope. You have to use special filters. And so over the past uh, six months, I have uh, been experimenting with imaging the sun I had a, um, a refractor. This is a, a four-inch refractor, a 102 millimeter refractor that was collecting dust. Uh, so I decided to buy a special filter for observing the sun. This is a day star, hydrogen alpha filter. It looks at a specific wavelength where you can see incredible detail in the uh, solar atmosphere, an intermediate atmosphere of the sun called the chromosphere. Normally, when we view the sun with visible light, uh, and again, if I were to put a filter 
on the front of the telescope, you would see the sun like this. You would see what we call the photosphere. And you can see a couple of spots. Th these spots correspond to those two spots over here. And actually, this was uh, taken yesterday uh, around noon from my um, patio. I live in Covington. And so I, I have set up my solar gear in Covington, which is, uh, I guess, about an hour and 15 minutes from Deer Lake Astronomy Village. And so on sunny days, I, I try to do some solar astrophotography coming up the learning curve. But it always astonishes me when I think about the sun not only being a star, but how large the sun is. You can see over here this. Here's the, the planet Jupiter and the Earth. And I believe this is 10, um, 10 Earths, that scale bar. So the, these two sunspots, look at the distance between those two sunspots. Here it is here. This, if you had the planet Jupiter, that's approximately the size of Jupiter relative to the sun. The sun is really trem uh, tremendous. So with a, a special telescope, you can um, see spots on the sun. And you can also see a lot of activity in the chromosphere above the photosphere. And then also in uh, just just above, you, you start going out into the uh, corona. But here we have what we call prominences on the limb of the sun. And these are a little hard to capture. The sun has been really quiescent over the last, um, uh, I'd say, half a dozen years or so. And it's starting to come back up in activity. We're starting to see some sunspots. So this is really exciting. And I thought, hey, let me jump into uh, solar astronomy. I can get some sleep at night. I don't have to, to, uh, to uh, stay up all night. And, and I, have to, I, I always remind myself that I'm looking at a star, which is really cool. So for solar astronomy, you might specialize in, in looking at um, the uh, chromosphere. Uh, uh, these prominences, loops of gas extending out from the edge of the sun, or interesting um, formations uh, within the um, chromosphere. Or um, a good way to get started is just uh, a regular solar filter on the front of the telescope so you can see the photosphere and the, um, the cool sunspots. All right, let's uh, progress on to, to the planets. Um, what, what I'm going to do is just, I, I'm starting from things that are really close, uh, the moon and the sun, although the, you know, keep in mind the sun is 93 million miles away. Then we'll go out to planets and comets and then things that you can photograph um, elsewhere beyond the solar system, in our galaxy and beyond uh, the Milky Way galaxy. Now, re really, it was kind of odd. Most astro, um, astrophotographers began by photographing stars in the moon and galaxies and stuff. But I got, actually got really serious about astrophotography uh, because of this planet here. Uh, one of my neighbors out at the astronomy uh, village is a seasoned astrophotographer, Dan Llewellyn. And uh, one night, <laughs> I noticed he was out with his telescope at about 2 a.m., so I, I went over there with a cup of coffee, and he was imaging Jupiter. And I, I couldn't believe the results he was getting for Jupiter, because it turned out I had the very same camera. It's an ASI224 camera that I had bought a couple of years earlier, but I couldn't really get it to work, and I got frustrated and put it into a drawer. But Dan was getting these marvelous images um, of Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, and Venus. And, and so I would spend night after night, you know, if I'd see him over there, <laughs> you know, 4 a.m., I'd walk over and look over his shoulder, and, and he would 
uh, give me some tips on imaging. So I thought, well, let me hook um, my camera up and see if I can image Jupiter. And uh, under his uh, direction, I was starting to, to actually get some good pictures of the planets. And then I really got hooked on astrophotography. The first year I was out at the Astronomy Village, all I wanted to do was just observe the Milky Way and see the stars and uh, use my telescope to look at star clusters or sit in a lawn chair and look for meteors. And then so the second year, as I uh, started learning about astrophotography, I, I got hooked on imaging, imaging the stars. And these two images, the image of Jupiter and of Saturn, these were taken uh, toward the end of last year. Those two planets were in the evening sky. You may have seen um, a couple of bright objects over in the west, or maybe uh, came over to uh, tell us to look at these planets, to see the rings of Saturn or the great red spot of Jupiter. Those planets were putting on a, on a really good show toward the end of last year. And these were taken, uh, I want to say both of these images in October of, of last year, Jupiter and Saturn. Now here's an image of Mars that was taken the previous year, the previous October. Every two years, Mars and Earth line up, so it's a good time to, to image Mars. And I, I was really astounded at some of the detail that you can see on Mars. You can see uh, the south, actually this, uh, the Im what a telescope will do is it'll invert the image. So north is at the bottom. This is the north polar ice cap. Over here are some clouds over the south pole. Um, this round feature here is a big impact base, and you can just see it as a light feature here. Uh, that's Hellas, the largest impact crater, one of the largest impact craters, impact basins in the solar system. And then this triangular wedge Certus Major. This is a volcanic area. There's a, a large volcano there, Certus Major. So I, I was astounded at the, the detail that you can see on some of these planets. You know, volcanoes and big craters on Mars, the great red spot of Jupiter, and even the division in the uh, rings of Saturn and cloud bands on Saturn. This is the Cassini division. So after imaging the planets, I thought, well, <laughs> I'm going to see if I can uh, find other things in the sky, including comets. Uh, you may have had an opportunity to see the Christmas comet, Comet Leonard, put on a great show around the holiday, this past holi holiday, uh, two months ago in the evening sky. And this is an image I took with my wide field Rasa 8 telescope, and it it really is astonishing with astrophotography that you start to bring out the color because I had been looking at this comet through my telescope and I couldn't see that much color. Um, but because the camera uh, collects photons of light over a period of time, um, I think this is uh, a series of two minute exposures, uh, you begin to accumulate uh, those photons and begin to see the true color of the comet, this greenish, uh, greenish nucleus in coma. And you can see the yellowish dust tail extending off, and then a gas tail, these uh, sh um, straight um, tail-like things extending off, the um, plasma tail coming off of the comet. And so comets are a lot of fun to, to image. There were a couple of comets in the sky in December, and I had quite a bit of free time over the holiday. Another one that uh, was putting on a good show is Comet 67P. And I, I am not going to attempt to pronounce the uh, two Russian astronomers' names that discovered the comet. Uh, this, this image was taken on December 13th before Christmas, and again, you can see the beautiful green coma and the dust tail extending out. Um, whenever you see a P behind uh, 
a comet designation 67P. That means it, it is a periodic comet. And this one was discovered by these two Russian astronomers in 1969. And I, I took this one using uh, a series of two minute exposures over about 20 minutes. So it, it's the equivalent of a 20 minute exposure. You accumulate those photons to get that. Um, let's see, this, oh, okay. I wanted to say, it, it's kind of interesting when you're looking at these things to um, understand the history of when it was discovered. Comets are named after their discoverers. And, and this actually was the first comet ever orbited and landed on by a space probe, a space probe called Rosetta. So <laughs> when, when I was taking pictures of that, I was thinking about that little space probe sitting on top of that, uh, that comet, what that must be like. Another comet, um, this, actually, I took this image in early January of uh, Comet 2019 L3 Atlas. And uh, this is uh, a 17, 17 or 20 one-minute exposures. Not really seeing the, uh, the green coma, but you can see, I believe this comet was pretty far away from the sun. You can still see the dust and gas tail extending off. So uh, that's something new that I've gotten into. And you find when you do astrophotography, you may start out with the moon and planets or star clusters. And, and then you start thinking about what else is out there to take pictures of. And, and so it's a lot of fun to, to find new and interesting targets uh, with your telescope. Much, much of the detail that you bring out in much of the challenge of astrophotography it has to do with um, software, <laughs> doing image processing. And that, um, there's a lot of good software packages out there. This is a, a good one. The learning curve is pretty steep, picks insight. Um, when you start talking to other astrophotographers, um, you'll, you'll start learning about uh, Photoshop and uh, Autostacker and Registack, but these are, are just uh, different software packages that you can use to, um, to do image processing. But the fun thing is acquiring and just looking at the beauty of the cosmos, seeing what's out there. And so what I'm going to do from here on out is uh, show images of what you can see. Let's say you're taking a celestial tour of the night sky. You know, what are, are some of the places that you would visit? And one would be uh, clouds of dust and gas, nebulae. Um, I'll also show images of star clusters, they're young clusters of stars, open clusters, ancient clusters, globular clusters, and other galaxies um, uh, beyond uh, the Milky Way. Lots and lots of <laughs> thousands of galaxies out there to, to image. But let me show you a couple, couple of my favorite uh, nebulae or nebulas. This one is the Orion Nebula. And I think with the weather being clear tonight, um, that should be a prime target up in the observatory tonight. After the program, if you go out, it should be nice and dark. You can see beautiful Orion Nebula, which is about 1,400 light years away, pretty far away, still part of the Milky Way galaxy. And it's a stellar nursery where new stars are forming in the Milky, uh, Milky Way galaxy. Now, one of my, my overall favorite uh, nebula to, to photograph is um, this beautiful, um, whoops, let's see, maybe hit the wrong button there, uh, this beautiful rose in the sky, the Rosetta 
Nebula. It's even further away than the Orion Nebula, about 5,000 light years out. And both of these images were taken with my wide field RASA 8 uh, telescope with the ASI 294 camera. And um, the Rosetta image was taken over a period of, of about an hour, and this was um, last month. In early January, I snapped that at about 4 a.m. in the morning. And uh, what, what you see here is a group of very young stars that have formed out of the surrounding cloud of dust and gas. And it is just quite beautiful. You see these dark lanes of dust and gas where new stars are forming. So these are both the Orion Nebula and the Rosetta are stellar factories where we find uh, brand new stars forming in the Milky Way. Here's another um, beautiful nebula where stars are forming. And this one, I love this one, it's called the California Nebula <laughs> because it sort of looks like uh, the state of California. And I, actually, I took this one January of last year, and it, it's really a huge glowing uh, cloud of dust and gas that we call an emission nebula, has this reddish tint to it, and it's about 1,000 light years away. And so within this nebula, we're seeing sort of areas where new stars, planets, and maybe one day life will form in our galaxy, some uh, 1,000 light years off. Really, really pretty to see. I love how uh, astronomers <laughs> come up with names for celestial objects, these deep sky objects. Uh, this one on the left is the Elephant Trunk Nebula. And I took that, uh, that was back in September of last year. And the cool thing about astrophotography is as the seasons go by, as, as the Earth revolves around the sun, uh, we're delighted to see a new host of constellations and celestial objects come into view. So these are seasonal objects. Uh, most astrophotographers uh, think of the Elephant Trunk Nebula as something that you would image in early autumn. And that, that's when I was able to do that. The other nebula um, was taken a little later in the year, the Trifid Nebula. And this one shows uh, an interesting um, color variation from red to blue. This is emission, where the young stars are exciting the dust and gas, causing uh, the gas to glow red, mostly hydrogen and helium. And then over here, the blue, this is a reflection nebula. And so star formation is sort of going in this direction. Uh, these uh, stars here are somewhat older than the stars here. And you can go back, you can see these young clusters of stars back here. This uh, particular object is about 5,500 light years away, and it's found near the center of our galaxy in the constellation of um, Sagittarius, and certainly would be an object that we would look at uh, during the summertime here at, at TELUS with a 20-inch telescope. Uh, that image is uh, a compilation of 22-minute exposures um, so about 40 minutes of photon collecting on the CMOS ship. It's a large area of, of uh, star formation and dust and gas in the Milky Way called, um, this one's pretty cool. It took me a while to figure this out because there's so much going on. See if you can see uh, a silhouette or an outline of North America. It's called the North American Nebula. Part of it is, do you see um, North America here, I guess? 
that would be um, the Gulf of Mexico and coming down toward Mexico here. Sort of a you stretch your imagination, you can trace out uh, North America. This one's even more challenging, the Pelican Nebula over here. See if you can see a pelican, maybe the head up in, in that area. And these are found in the uh, constellation of Cygnus the Swan, um, about 1,500 light years away. And you have this really dark, thick cloud of dust and gas that separate the two, sort of dust and gas in here. And that, that will certainly be an area for fertile uh, new star formation and perhaps even planets one day. Okay, what else do we have? So we have areas of um, dust and gas where new planets are forming, stars are forming. Then we have these other really cool objects um, that are sites of stellar death. The Crab Nebula is what we call a supernova remnant, where a star exploded in the year 1054 AD, recorded by Chinese and uh, Chinese sky watchers. And over here is one of my favorite uh, objects in the sky called the Helix Nebula, but also called the Eye of God. Astronomers refer to it as the Eye of God. It looks like he has a blue eye right there, staring back at you. But that is a site also where um, a star has died, a low-mass star. Um, the outer atmosphere is separated from the star, maybe a star like the sun. That's, you know, if we come back, if we were to go into the future, Five billion years from now, this is what our solar system may look like. Uh, at the center is a white dwarf star, a stellar quartz, about the size of the Earth. Most of the sun's atmosphere would have separated. Um, inner planets, unfortunately, will be vaporized. But from afar, it, it's a very, very beautiful object, and the colors make it a fun object to shoot uh, with the telescope and camera. Let's see, that one, I took that, that's an autumn object, the uh, Helix Nebula back in September, it's about 600 light years away, and that was taken with my, uh, both of these images with the Celestron 14 inch telescope. It's really a versatile telescope, uh, the 14 inch, because it can operate at different focal lengths, um, depending on what camera and what instrumentation you have on it. Um, it can run all the, for the uh, photographers here, anywhere from F2 to F22. F2, really wide field, to F22, um, long focal length for imaging um, planets. Okay, let's see what else we have. Here's a, a beautiful cluster of stars that you can see tonight. No telescope is required. And in fact, most telescopes, the field of view is too small to pull in the entire open, st uh, open star cluster that we call the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. And this, this is one of the first deep sky objects that I imaged uh, a few years ago. And I was astounded at about how much detail and um, also just the really beautiful blue color. Um, with uh, the naked eye, when you see this in the sky, we, we often call it the Seven Sisters. It'll look like a little smudgy, almost a uh, little tiny, a small dipper. It's not the Little Dipper, often confused for the Little Dipper. But through the telescope, you see more stars. And then when you um, collect those photons from those stars, you begin to see the surrounding halo of dust and gas from which these stars formed. And if it's a blue nebula, it's referred to as a ref uh, reflection nebula. This one's about 450 light years away in the constellation of Taurus. And those bright white stars are illuminating that dust and uh, gas 
one of the one of the really most beautiful objects that you can see in the night sky with a naked eye or through a telescope and also with the uh, camera. Some other um, clusters of stars. Often you see dust and gas mixed in. This one is called the Christmas tree cluster. You can, it looks like uh, maybe a Christmas tree that toppled over. Maybe a cat jumped on top of it and knocked it over. Um, over here, we call this the cone nebula. It's a cone-shaped wedge of dark dust and gas here. So this is, is referred to as the cone nebula or Christmas tree cluster. Uh, this was taken, I took this image back in December. Remember, it was really cold early morning, around 3 a.m. And um, it's found near Orion the Hunter in the constellation of the unicorn, Monoceros. And it's, a, it's kind of a cool holiday object photograph because of the, uh, the shape of a, a Christmas tree up there in the sky. It's about 2,500 light years away. And that, that exposure is a, a, a total exposure time, actually, of about an hour and a half of collecting light from that. Over here is a, a target that you might see tonight, the double cluster, H and Chi Persei, in the constellation of Perseus. Really, really beautiful telescopic object and a fun object to image. It's a good target if you're just getting into astrophotography because you, you can't go wrong. You just aim your telescope if it's focused. If you have a good focus, a, a 30 second exposure will begin to show those stars. Look, looks like lots and lots of little diamonds in the sky. Let's see, how are we doing here? Okay, a little bit more time. Just uh, taking you on a celestial tour of the sky of our beautiful cosmos. Um, so if you were going on vacation through the cosmos, maybe our uh, uh, distant grandchildren will be able to, like on Star Trek, <laughs> take trips through the Milky Way. What would you go see? Well, I would certainly have on my list a globular star cluster. And here we have two um, bright uh, clusters, the great Hercules star cluster on the left with about 300 million stars. Um, and then the one on the right is... Uh, one that we call the gumball cluster. It does look like, because of the color blue and, and red stars, it looks like a bunch of gumballs in the sky. Uh, that one's about 1,600 light years away. And the Hercules cluster, this one is close to 25,000 light years away. I always enjoy imaging or taking, um, taking photographs of M13, as we call it, because it was back in 1974 that Carl Sagan and his colleagues, um, the famous astronomer Carl, Carl Sagan, led an effort to send a message to 300,000 stars. The great uh, Arecibo message of 1974 was beamed to uh, the Hercules cluster. Now, it's going to take 25,000 years for that message to reach the stars, and if there happen, happen to be planets with intelligent life and they respond, it will be another 25,000 years before we hear back. So 50,000 50, year delayed <laughs> communication. But very, very pretty. These globulars are, are spectacular to, to see through the telescope or uh, with the camera. Moving on to, to galaxies, we'll finish up with um, some pictures of galaxies. This one is one that we find um, in, um, it's in the southern sky. 
southern part of the sky, and it's, it's really quite large. I, I'm always astonished when I see this uh, through the eyepiece of a telescope, how big this looks. It's called um, the Silver Coin or Silver Dollar Galaxy. It sort of looks like a silver dollar uh, laying on its side. And it's about 11 million light years away. And this is a two-hour exposure through my uh, Celestron 14-inch telescope. Many of the galaxies, in fact, most galaxies, we believe, including our Milky Way galaxy, have a supermassive black hole at their core. That, that's a really fun and easy target to shoot um, with the telescope. Another one is this spiral galaxy we call the Triangulum Galaxy, found in the constellation of Triangulum. And this is uh, an autumn constellation. So I took this picture back in early October of last year uh, with, um, I think I had my C-14 telescope operating at F2. So fairly wide field. It's a pretty nearby galaxy, about um, almost 3 million light years away, which is galaxy-wise. Uh, pretty close. And what makes this one a great target for astrophotographers is its face on to, to us uh, as we look out into space. You can see um, the core of the galaxy, some red emission clouds along the spiral arms where new stars are forming, some blue reflection nebulae out here. Uh, clusters of stars. It's really a beautiful um, galaxy. But the best known galaxy of all, if you, if, you ever, if you have ever seen a galaxy through a telescope, uh, the Andromeda galaxy is probably the one that you have seen. Um, it's, it's the largest and brightest galaxy that we can see in the sky. This was taken back in September. It's an autumn object. You can really see it with a naked eye if somebody shows you where to look. Uh, we've all heard that expression, as far as the eye can see. Well, that's it. Two million light years away. Looks like a smudge of light. You're looking beyond the Milky Way to a collection of about a trillion stars. And that is really a cool galaxy. I wish it were up where we could look at it tonight, but if you come back in the autumn, I, I think every Friday night uh, from September through at least November, um, most public observatories like here at TELUS will be checking out the Andromeda galaxy. Now, one of my other favorite galaxies is the Needle Galaxy. And this was an image I took back in June of 2020. Um, and I was r really astonished at the amount of detail that my, my telescope could bring out. Uh, this galaxy is about 40 million light years away compared to the Andromeda galaxy, two and a quarter million. And it's found in the constellation of Coma Bernice, uh, Bernices. And I think this is a two-hour uh, integrated exposure, um, 60 two-minute exposures stacked. And you can see this, this particular galaxy is edge-on. Um, you're looking not face-on, but if the galaxy is sort of on its side, you can see these lanes of, cloud, of dust and gas extending through the galaxy with some color variation, blue, blue stars uh, or blue clouds of dust and gas extending out like that. That's a fairly famous galaxy. I was looking through a, um, an old <laughs> Palomar um, book, uh, the big observatory, the big eye, back in 1948, um, the 200-inch telescope was uh, commissioned at Palomar near uh, San Diego. 
And this book from the 50s, I was seeing uh, pictures taken by uh, the big 200-inch telescope that really did not have this clarity of the, the needle galaxy. And it's amazing how technology has changed where an amateur astronomer with a relatively small telescope and a powerful digital camera can uh, outdo what the astronomers were doing uh, with, a, with the world's largest telescope at the time back in the um, 50s and 60s and 70s. Okay, so um, I think we have just a couple more galaxies. The um, Whirlpool Galaxy, a great target during the springtime to look at through a telescope. You can see the beautiful face-on spiral structure of the galaxy. Uh, this particular galaxy is 30 million light years away, much, much further out. And cataloged as, once you get into looking at these things through uh, the telescope or with the camera, you'll see uh, M51 or M13, as I mentioned before, with the globular cluster. There was a French astronomer back in the 1700s, Charles Messier, who was famous for logging the 100 best celestial objects in the sky. And this was number 51 in his catalog. And I took this one, let's see, it was about a year ago, back in February of last year. This is a three-hour exposure. Because of the distant, distance of the galaxy, uh, you can go with a longer exposure. Now, one question um, that I get as an astrophotographer is, why don't you just aim the camera and take a, leave the shutter open and, and take a three-hour exposure and be done with it, rather than shooting two-minute exposures and stacking them, or one-minute exposures. The, the problem is, um, if a satellite goes through the field of view, uh, which often will happen, or if a cloud drifts by, you may lose a couple of images, but you're not losing you know, two hours of photon collection. Also, a gust of wind may come up and cause the telescope to vibrate. And so if you're sitting on that, let's say, for two hours and 30 minutes, and then it vibrates, the whole two hours and 30 minutes is lost. Whereas if you've got a series of one-minute exposures, you may just throw out a handful of those exposures. And the first thing that I will do with that um, three, uh, uh, let's say if it's uh, three hours of exposures, not, uh, 90 two-minute two exposures is, I will go through and look at them individually and, and throw out the ones that look blurry or if a satellite drifted through the field of view or a cloud came by, I, I could throw all those out and then stack those images. But you can get the same results from 60 one-minute exposures as you can get with one single exposure of 60 minutes. So astrophotographers choose to go with short exposures, many short exposures, and then using software to stack those images. Now the last image here is uh, one that, um, I believe this is one I took last weekend of the Starburst Galaxy in Ursa Major, or the uh, Cigar Galaxy, that um, our astronomers here may be looking at tonight. This is a good galaxy, M82, uh, in the constellation of Ursa Major. And what, what you're seeing is the unusual uh, central area that's kind of red and muddy looking is uh, there's a huge amount of star formation happening around the core of that galaxy. And so that's kind of cool that with a small telescope we can, we can see that kind of detail. Uh, I do have a, a site that I maintain, um, yep, coming up on 8 o'clock, on AstroBin. And many of us, at, this is a fun site if you start getting into astrophotography. Google Astro Bin, you can go in and, and look at what folks are doing all over the world. You have, I, I kind of consider myself an almost intermediate astrophotographer. 
Um, they're, they're the advanced astrophotographers will, some of these images on Astrobin that, that these folks will show are, are just uh, incredible. And, um, and it's a good way for us astrophotographers to see what other people are doing. You, you know, uh, you can look at what they call the big wall, and, and it will show recently posted images. And it's a great way for myself and other astrophotographers to sort of collect your, your images to uh, keep track of what, what you've photographed over the years. But when you look at the big wall, you'll go, oh, OK, there is the, the um, let, let's say, the Witch Head Nebula. I hadn't realized that that was up. Let me, let me see if I can take a picture of, of that tonight. So anyway, I um, <laughs> hope, hope you enjoyed the tour of the cosmos from my humble observatory out in the middle of nowhere, Tolliver County. <laughs> All right, we'll turn it back over to Dave. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ed. That was wonderful. Uh, if you have a question, uh, just raise your hand. We have time for a few questions. And uh, I'll run over with the microphone so everybody can hear your question and also be uh, recorded. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. Oh, I see a first brave person way over here. So. Is the Deer Lick Observatory open to the public at all? And if so, when? Yeah, good, good question. Uh, we have, uh, the, there are two observing fields. One is for members that own property, and then there's another, the northern part of the 96 acres is an open field for public observing. So you can, uh, we have public events uh, about every other month, but you, if you're interested in um, Becoming a member of the Deer Lake Astronomy Village, you can join and you get access to, it's a, it's a gated community, so it's really safe to be out, <laughs> you know, in the middle of nowhere, 4 a.m. in the morning. Um, the gate will open and you can, usually observers come in and set up telescopes on the field uh, before sundown and we'll set tents up. We have uh, a warm house or a, or warm, a warm up shed uh, there's a patio for grilling. You could do um, uh, dinner, barbecue. Uh, there's some observing pads and power supplies and everything to come out. So it is, to answer your question, it's open to the public. And if you go, just look up Deer Lick Astronomy Village. It's like Deer, D-E-E-R, Lick. Has nothing to do with deer. There's a, a galaxy cluster in the sky called the Deer Lick Group. And one of the founding astronomers of the Astronomy Village. Uh, this was back in 2006. That was his favorite cluster of galaxies, so he decided to call it uh, the uh, Deer Lick, <laughs> Deer Lick Astronomy Village. <laughs> Personally, I would like to change, <laughs> I've talked to folks out there, change the uh, name of the village to Starland. Because <laughs> that's what I think of when I go out there. I'm out in Starland. <laughs> so my, my wife and daughter was like, oh, Ed's going. Dad's going out to uh, Starland. <laughs> Other questions? I see some back up here. Do you use filters, especially on the nebulas? Oh, yeah, I do. Uh, and uh, thanks for asking that question. I forgot to mention that. Both of my telescopes, even in a dark, skate, uh, dark sky site, I use a uh, general astrophotography light pollution filter. There's one designed specifically for the wide field RASA, and then I use, um, it's from a company called Orion. Orion Telescopes makes a nice two inch filter. So I put that in front of the camera. Even at, in the dark sky site, because of humidity and whatnot, there's a lot of scattering of light. So if you don't filter that out, it's hard to go more than a minute or two uh, really more than a minute without the, the background getting washed out. Yes, yeah, so that's very important. Okay, I got another question right here. Uh, I was wondering, um, 
If you want to start observing the night sky, do you suggest any like starting telescopes, like start um, doing the night sky? Oh, what what was the question again? Uh, do you suggest any starting uh, telescopes for um, observing the night sky? Yeah, some beginner telescopes. I would recommend, I know Dave and I, um, we usually recommend a 90 millimeter refractor. This has uh, a lens that is about three inches across on a long tube that sits on a special astronomy mount called an equatorial mount. Uh, there's a comp that company, Orion Telescopes, they typically have one for, um, they're, they're not cheap, but they are good telescopes, about $300 in that range. Yeah, that's a, a 90 millimeter refractor is a good way to start. All right, time for one more question. Oh, right here. Uh, kind of rela related off of that question, if you wanted to photograph like a nebula, what kind of equipment, how much would that be? Okay, well, um, like the Orion Nebula would be a good place to start. And re really, if you had, let's say you had a 90 millimeter refractor, um, with tracking, that, that's one of the challenges of astrophotography is as the Earth rotates, you and I are moving from west to east, so we see the sun, the moon, and the stars rise in the east and set over in the west. So you have to compensate by tracking the, the celestial objects. So you would need uh, an equatorial mount and a clock drive to track. And then... Um, a camera, a basic um, CMOS camera, maybe a couple of hundred dollars. They have, in fact, all of the cameras I use are one-shot color cameras. I should have mentioned that. Um, it, it used to be that everybody that was doing astrophotography, they, they would shoot what you call a luminous image, which is a black and white image, and then you'd put in another filter, you put in a red filter, a, a green and a blue filter, and then you'd have to use your software to combine those four images to get a color picture. And that, a lot of astrophotographers still do that. That's a lot of work, but the technology has gotten to the point that these one-shot color cameras um, will do all that work for you. So uh, you're you're not having to combine all these different images. You're still stacking images, but all of those images are in color. So that cuts out a lot of the tedium from uh, <laughs> trying to combine those images. Well, thank you, Ed. Uh, Ed will be out in the observatory. You can talk to him some more, and if you have more, think of more questions, I'm sure he'd love to talk to you. And please, let's thank Ed one more time. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.